Well, welcome to the European Green Deal Show. Um, we're going to welcome our guests in a moment. We're just going to kick off with a short video just to focus on what this is all about. Picture this. It is 2050 and together we have built a climate neutral society. Solar and wind energy has replaced fossil fuels. Our cars, buildings and factories use clean energy and we breathe clean. Well, we're, we're having some um, technical problems there and uh, apologies uh, for that. Uh, but hopefully Ryan, Hunter and Ian Aitchison can hear me. Indeed I can. Okay, well, welcome to uh, the European Green Deal Show, Transport Day Special. We can tell it's live because of the technical problems that we've been having. Um, but the, uh, as always with these shows, we will continue until we can uh, restore that intro video and uh, put the, set the scene on, on uh, the European Green Deal, COP26 and uh, Transport Day. So we're now halfway through the second week, maybe a quick view from, from Ryan and uh, from Ian on, on where things stand. Are we tr anywhere closer to reaching that 1.5 degrees Celsius target? Firstly, Ryan. Hi, Mark. Um, hi, Ian. Uh, good to be with you again. Um, well, I think uh, if you take the, the mantra of COP26 to be keep 1.5 alive, um, I think, yes, we are, we are closer today than we were when COP uh, began. You've had some uh, pretty major announcements from countries like India. You've also had some uh, uh, agreements between countries like the, the U.S. and the EU on their methane agreement. Uh, you've had a deforestation uh, pledge. Uh, and you've had several other announcements that, taken together, seem to have pushed us further along the path towards 1.5. Uh, now, depending who you ask, we are we are not as close as, as, as some others might think. Um, but the general consensus is that with the current pledges, we will find ourselves somewhere in between 2.1 to 2.7 degrees Celsius. So closer than we were, but still very far away. And achievements so far, Ryan? Well, uh, lots of pledges, um, which is really sort of what comes out of these things. Uh, so it's hard to say uh, what's an achievement, but if you can uh, remember what we said two weeks ago uh, going into COP, that a lot of what uh, we were talking about, very negative mood music, uh, I think uh, in that context, this COP has achieved a lot more than we expected, and that can only be a good thing. Uh, you know, be that down to the uh, UK's leadership uh, or even the, the US and the EU uh, as well. And on the screen now, you can see some of those achievements uh, there. Um, and I think that uh, the mood music in the second week and leaving COP will be much, much better than it was uh, coming into COP. And that's, uh, I think that's an achievement in and of itself. Well, thanks, uh, Ryan. We're going to bring in some other guests uh, very soon. I know Tony Barkley and Murad Qureshi are, are waiting in the studio to, to come in live. I think from Westminster and from Glasgow. But first of all, live from Scotland, uh, Ian, you joined us a few weeks ago on the on the first show. Um, what's your take so far? Have we covered the ground, made the progress, achieved the success that we were hoping to achieve by this stage? Hi, Mark Ryan. I think it depends on who you ask. Um, I know you're a fan of music, uh, Mark, and I have in my head that going round and round at the moment. One more step along the road we go. Uh, and I think it's been moved forward. We've had people working together, uh, which I think is great. That you know, There's nobody walked out. Uh, and I think, as I said previously, the fact is there is no debate about whether we are in a climate crisis or not. I think that's a huge achievement from where we've been before. And now it's just a case of the speed. So I think there's been a broad agreement that we need to do something. And, the, you know, the devil's in the detail on how we can do it. Uh, both the speed and the means to which we do it. Uh, I think there's a debate, particularly in, in my field in shipping, and whether we have to wait for zero carbon fuels. Are we talking zero carbon or are we talking net zero? Uh, if we talk zero carbon fuels, there aren't any for the shipping industry. You know, For the rail industry, we've got electricity, but is that electricity all renewable? Where is that coming from? I know Tony's an expert on, on the train side of things. But I, I think, um, for me, the fact that everybody's still talking 
Uh, the fact the Prime Minister's on his way there is always presumably good news because he wouldn't be going there unless we think there's something positive going to happen. Uh, so I think it's, and we've had a, a communique published overnight, which is generally uh, pushing people forward. There clearly is pressure that, uh, as Ryan mentioned, we're still above two. We need to get near a 1.5 to avoid the worst of climate extremes. Uh, so I think, uh, but, you know, people were, as Ryan mentioned, pretty doubtful we'd achieve anything. So I think there have been some achievements, uh, but you'll never satisfy all of the people all of the time. Uh, but I think we, we've managed to satisfy a good few people and we're making progress still going forward. Well, thank, thank, thanks, Ian, for that uh, perspective. I know, I know you always see the uh, glass as half uh, full rather than half empty. And I think that's your assessment uh, so far. But again, I think a bit of confusion overnight with those um, figures from the Climate Action Tracker saying that we're on course more more for around 2.4% by the end of the century compared to the International Energy Agency's more optimistic forecast of 1.8. I mean, just have a quick uh, look at those figures from the CAT that came in overnight, showing you there that, 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 that 2.7 is uh, more likely, maybe 2.4 on an optimistic scenario. Do you want to just uh, walk us through that, uh, Ryan? What, why this confusion? I mean, yeah, Ian's obviously an optimist on this, but these are scientists that seem to disagree on the science. Are you forcing me to be the pessimist? Um, Not at well, all. I, I think I think that the difference it really comes down to to how much weight you give to certain pledges uh, and how you analyze what uh, a fully implemented version of those pledges looks like. Uh, and these are all models, and so. Uh, whatever your inputs are into that model will impact your conclusion. Uh, and this is what I think is uh, creating such a divide and difference between the models. Um, on, as you mentioned, on the optimistic side, you have the IEA that puts us uh, at 1.8 degrees Celsius. Uh, and some of the realists are looking more and towards the upper echelons of 2.5 and 2.8 degrees Celsius. Um, but really, the devil is in the detail. We, we, as we always say, how things are implemented, how quickly they're implemented, uh, is going to make all the difference here. Uh, and if we look at these pledges as an opening salvo as well, we have plenty of room to go further. So uh, I'll plant myself on Ian's optimistic side, recognizing that uh, implementation here will be key uh, beyond the pledges. I think uh, just to add, Mark, to, to what Ryan said, yes, optimistic they will get there. Do I think we've done enough? No way. We're well beyond 1.5, whatever way you look at, and there's still an awful lot more to do. But do I think we can move on it? Yes, I do. How quickly? Clearly, that's a political decision and it remains to be seen. But but we are making progress, which I think is the main point. We just need to, to ratchet up and, and use, I think, most of what, best of what we've got at the moment with, with some new technology coming in. And I think if you look at, you know, from the commercial side, any boardroom discussion now has got to look at greenhouse gas emissions and what they're doing. We've seen all these pledges coming out. And whilst for government, sometimes a change of government or, or what you say and what you do isn't necessarily the same thing, as Mark, you know only too well. But I think for, for companies, very often it's harder to back out uh, for pledges that they've made and people have an expectation and you get people put in, in gear and going forward. So I think we've seen some some major developments in, in, in transport this week. I think we've seen BP and, and Daimler coming together to look at hydrogen network for the UK. Uh, and others. I think these are these are steps, as I say, each step along the road. But it, but it's we're on a the ratchet's only going one way. OK, we will bring you back in. So do stand by if you, if you don't mind. Um, but we're going to bring in some other guests now if we can. Uh, Murad, I, I know you're uh, trying to uh, connect uh, from Glasgow, but in the meantime, we're going to bring in uh, Tony Barkley in. Uh, Tony Barkley, as probably many of you know, um, is a civil engineer primarily and an expert on transport, but also a member of, of the House of Lords, very active on uh, uh, transport and uh, Green Deal and decarbonisation uh, issues. Um, I know you're on mute, Tony, but if uh, you want to perhaps give us your, your take on where things stand on Transport Day at COP26. Well, thank, thank you, Mark. I've just about lost my voice at the moment. Can you hear me all right? Yep, we can. <clears throat> Sorry about that, but uh, do struggle on. And we'll do our um, to, uh... um, yeah. Um, I, I think there's been progress, as we've heard, and I think that's really good. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> I still don't see enough acceptance by governments that there has to be a change of lifestyle. 
um, because whatever we do, whether it's one and a half, two or two and a half degrees, we can argue about that. But um, to try and find ways of wriggling out of a change of lifestyle, I don't think will be sufficient. Um, this particularly applies to air. Um, it also applies to um, surface transport. Um, and I think we ought to look much more closely at do we need to achieve whatever our personal or corporate objectives are by um, traveling so much, by traveling so fast, um, or can we do it some other way? And I think the COVID epidemic has given us a chance to, to consider these things. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, it's a great pity though that we, the government, our government, is not setting an example, rather a, a, an example by um, increasing the cost of motoring and reducing the cost of railways for a start, and and also um, reducing the um, sorry increasing the costs of flying and to reduce the costs of um, domestic flight seems to me to be totally counterproductive. I know it um, it helps people that live in regions and live, live down in Cornwall like I do, but. Um, there are other ways of doing it. And again, it's change of lifestyle. Do you need to get there quite so quickly or quite so frequently? So I suppose those are my thoughts, Michael. I mean, it's been a really good exercise um, at COVID. Um, lots of good things are coming out of it. But I think if people are beginning to learn that they're going to have to change their lifestyle, not, for the, not in a bad way, but just different way, um, and again, scooters, bicycles, walking, you know, um, it's back to the 20 minute um, community, which a lot of people are now talking about in the big cities to reduce the demands. I mean, that's my, a quick summary of my thoughts so far. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. Really, really appreciate that perspective and the need for, you know, building on what happened at COP, particularly in terms of uh, behavioral change. Very good point there on uh, to bring in uh, Murad uh, Qureshi, if, if I may. Appropriately enough, live from uh, Glasgow Central Station. Welcome, Murad. Hope you can hear us. H Hello, Mark. I'm, uh, I'm calling in from Glasgow Central. I thought it was the best place to do so, given it's transport day at COP26. Indeed. Do you, do you want to do you want to take us through? You you set the bar pretty high in an article. I think you wrote a week or so ago about you said it, it, it's worth asking what needs to happen for a successful COP in uh, Glasgow. We need not only to raise the ambition of national climate plans, but support the climate vulnerable developing countries, advance the Paris rule book. On your own criteria, Murad, is it a successful COP26? Well, I think uh, the, uh, the drift this week is certainly different from last week where I think there was a lot of optimism with all the side deals suggested on top of uh, the COP uh, Paris Accord. And uh, you've outlined them very well. I think the reality has hit home now this week, clearly now that uh, we've got a sense of where the, uh, the national climate plans, uh, the, 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 the full impact of the new ones submitted and the updated ones. Uh, we, we, we should be grateful for the ones that have been submitted by the Chinese and the Indians. But there's also another problem. They're not actually following the same time, time framework that uh, the rest of us are with 2030, 2030 uh, as the uh, peak, uh, peak uh, carbon demands and 2050 as net zero. Um, India, for example, is aiming at 2070 and China 2060. Uh, given they're two major polluters, uh, that needs to be sorted through the Paris rule book. Uh, something which I think um, the bureaucracies behind in the background need to come and get on top of. Well, thank you for that, uh, walking us through that, that um, it, uh, um, Murad. And, and I, I know you've been there, maybe talk a bit about the mood at uh, Glasgow as well as we enter the final days on, on Transport Day. But also, you know, you were, you were chair of the London Assembly's uh, Environment Committee uh, for um, for eight years. Um, what what you know on the back of this, the work clearly has to continue. What can cities like London, but also you know, cities all over Europe and the world, what can they now do to follow up uh, COP26? In your view, bear, bear in mind, most carbon emissions are concentrated in cities. Most of us are living in cities. There's still a migration towards cities despite the pandemic. You know, what leadership role can cities continue to make 
post COP26? No, I, I don't disagree with uh, much of what you've just said, Mark, there at all. I just think the, uh, the, the issue that can't be ignored, and it's an issue of trust, is clearly the, the climate finance issue. Um, and and um, that wasn't resolved beforehand, and I think it would have made for more productive and responsive uh, developing world countries delegations. I, I, they are perturbed by the fact that the, the 100 uh, billion hasn't been delivered yet when it was promised from uh, not actually Paris, but further back from Copenhagen days. Uh, and, it, and it'll take two or three years yet. Uh, so it does actually, um, I think, highlight very clearly uh, the grand deal between the developed and developing world has yet to be really settled and make them feel comfortable that uh, we're going to deliver what we've said all along we need to do, uh, given our historical responsibilities to carbon uh, uh, in the atmosphere already. Well, well thank you uh, very much, uh, Moran. I'm glad the technology held up for, for you to speak to us live from, 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 from Glasgow. Thanks very much for your, for your time. We'll, we'll no doubt be having this show, as you know, probably every two weeks now. It'd be great to have you back in a couple of weeks or a few weeks' time just to see it at the, by the end of COP whether or not you know, your, your benchmarks that you laid down have been edged closer to uh, when, they, when they agreed the final communicate. We've seen the draft, and as you say, it's both good and, and there's frustration as well, and not, you know, not least in the developing world. So it'd be good to have you back on the show in a few weeks' time around right, to give us your assessment then. There is still a lot of nitty-gritty negotiating to be done. Um, I won't be surprised if it goes into the weekend, as it has done historically uh, at co COPS. Uh, I do know many of the delegations from the develop developing world are ready this time. They have often felt that they've had to rush back to connect on their to get their connecting flights uh, whilst the real negotiating happens. So I, I do think they'll be around. And I hope more lead room, lead room is given to take on board their concerns and what have you. Um, I, I suspect a lot of issues are going to be left outstanding and uh, we'll be take, waiting to take the night train to Cairo sooner than we realise. Uh, and maybe that's a good point. Just to remind us, Murad, uh, COP27 next year, Cairo? Sorry, Mark, I didn't hear that. I've, um... Okay, so just remind us where, 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 where the COP is travelling. Uh, is it uh, The next one is in Egypt. I... Um... I, um, yeah, I've got to commit myself missed that, but I can guess where you're going. Um, yeah, I, I, in the next few days, will be keeping an eye on those final negotiations and where we go. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, whilst we've had other things like the methane and the deforestation added, we shouldn't lose sight of the main Paris Accord. And I suspect we've made more progress on those kind of uh, issues that were brought up last week than, than the Paris Accord. And I hope we can actually get to 1.5, maybe not this time but next time uh, with all the evaluated national climate plans okay thanks Murad, thank you thank so you much for your time Mark. we'll see you thank again you. soon speak soon goodbye well we're going to bring in back in um uh, tony uh and, and ian now maybe to focus on some of the uh, details of of transport day um i mean i know tony you've 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 expressed your frustration particularly about the need to change behavior and uk government policy but i mean one clear uh, deliverable Today is that COP26 declaration on accelerating the transition to 100% zero emission cars and vans. And if I read that the text that's been released, um, as governments, we will work towards all sales of new cars and vans being zero emission by 2040 or earlier or by no later than 2035 in leading markets. And a whole host of organizations, <coughs> private sector, Ford, GM, Mercedes, um, UK, uh, many uh, European governments and governments across the world have signed that pledge. Tony, first of all, I mean, isn't this the sort of uh, result that COP26 has achieved, that the world is now moving to phasing out uh, petrol and diesel engine cars <laughs> and light vans, which we don't need on our roads anymore? Well, <clears throat> that is absolutely true. Um, <clears throat> uh, we've got to make sure that the... Um, this is actually an honest change because um, one's got to look at how the electricity is generated for a start. And um, <clears throat> I think the other issue which people haven't um, really addressed is that um, 
although this is extremely good for the mass market and for people who live in the country and need and need personal transport, if that is the only thing that happens, then there'll be massive traffic jams still in every city, because it um, doesn't matter how, what powers the vehicles, if everybody's using them and saying, aren't we clever, we're um, using zero carbon, we won't be able to get around because um, <clears throat> there's a problem in cities. So I think it's a really good start. Um, and I think the other issue which we haven't mentioned, of course, is the heavy goods vehicles, because they're much more difficult to um, convert to zero carbon. As we all know, there's various different options being proposed. Um, <clears throat> but um, I'm not sure that putting a catenary over every motorway, as uh, testing in Germany, will probably be very popular, but still using electricity. Um, and otherwise, it's back to talk about hydrogen, which we can have a debate about, but um, there's pros and cons of this, um, or um, the lithium batteries, which are, are very, very heavy. But again, it comes here, is do we need to move all this stuff around quite so much? Because if we moved it less and we had more local consumption and delivery, um, then the demand would reduce. And I think we still we need to look at all of these things to make them work. And um, just a final one on this, um, if you can move quite a lot more of it by rail freight, which should be possible um, across, the, across Europe, certainly, and many other parts of the world, um, it's... Um, it's good that it can be done because there's more capacity on the railway because of less passenger demand. But you actually got to go one step further and um, uh, have the secondary distribution from the big centres also by rail, different type of rail, and then look at the, the shorter deliveries in cities, either by bicycles, freight bicycles or electric vehicles or smaller ones there and um, again we must look at the experience that Amazon has and others have been doing during Covid um, I'm not sure we've actually saved um, parcel miles in the last um, two years because of the amount of local home deliveries so all these things need looking at but it's a hell of a good start what's happened this week I think. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, Tony. Thanks for struggling on with your uh, challenging uh, voice at the moment. We appreciate your your, your views nonetheless, um, and appreciate your time. Bringing in uh, Tony, uh, bringing in Ian, if we, if if we may, maybe building on uh, what Tony ha has said. And incidentally, Tony, if you have to leave us now, because I know you've got probably a lot of business in the in the laws to attend to. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Tony, and hopefully you can be you can join us back on the program in a few weeks' time to see where where things stand. But moving over to you, Ian, focusing now on Transport Day, if we may. We heard from Tony Barkley there, very prominent vocal uh, activist peer in the House of Lords on transport policy, particularly on, on the, the rail freight side, giving a sort of a, I don't know, a green signal, though, to the government's announcements today with many of its international partners on, on zero emission uh, cars and vans. I, is that your take, too? And, and can we build on that, as Tony said? Yes, absolutely. And I think we mentioned two weeks ago, you know, once upon a time, they were shouting and screaming from the car manufacturers, we can't possibly do that. We don't hear that now. We've moved on. We're now looking at what do we do with the heavy goods vehicles? Uh, Tony's mentioned hydrogen and batteries, which have difficulties with, with scale. I know that uh, certain uh, for, for local distribution trucks, you can get uh, relatively big trucks on batteries if they're not traveling too far, although they're big, big cargoes. But I think the other one to look at is biogas. What do we do that? Can we can we use methane, which is a, a good energy density fuel, provided it comes from renewable sources? So I think the other point to make is, and I, I, I for one, actually see a huge benefit in COVID. It's been uh, truly catastrophic for many millions of people, but it has forced us to think. And I think that's what we're doing this like next two weeks too. During COP, we're having to think about the future rather than just carrying on blindly as we've done before. You know, I'm sat here in an agricultural background. We, we take harvest for granted. These are the things we need to think about. You know, is it where we have lived just in time? What about the just in case scenario and how we balance that? So I think, uh, as Lord Barclay has mentioned, we have to, to view a huge number of things about changes and where we go with it. But I think for me, that the one that we haven't yet got, we haven't got the integrated rail plan published for the UK, 
and wider, but where are we going with an integrated transport plan? And I think that's one of these huge things as we've talked very often before, Mark. You know, we have within UCTI a, a huge opportunity for bringing multiple sectors together, multimodal, which doesn't really exist. You know, the airlines talk to the airline industry, the shipping industry talk to the shipping industry, but very seldom we have the multimodal look at where's the best means of getting that free. And I think too, to pick up on the point about, about towns, we're seeing huge changes uh, just this week, you know, what's happening in, in the States. Has the car been the death knell of certain cities and breaking them up, you know, the death, but, you know, which like one side of the railway tracks or the or the freeway and interstate. So I think we'll see far greater involvement in town planners at looking at that. Uh, a statistic I saw this week, you know, the Pret sales for suburban London are still higher than they were before. So are people now looking to live locally and, and operate locally? And, and this may have impacts on transport. So I think there's, there's a huge amount to come. I think it's being driven by where do we want? And we have a chance with COP and being forced to look at it uh, through the climate change, you know, decisions that might have never had a thought, second thought to them are now getting two, three, four, five thoughts at them. And, and can we come up in a better way? Well, thank you for that, uh, Ian. We're, we're going to pursue that if we, we may. I think, first of all, you, you, know, you win the award, I think, for the best backdrop. Um, and that, that actually is not a virtual backdrop. You are actually sitting in front of some beautiful Scottish countryside there, I take it, Ian. Absolutely. November sunshine in Scotland. Yeah. Yes. In, de de definitely making the most and uh, joining us uh, live from Scotland outside, enjoying the, the beautiful weather there. Um, if we can move on to uh, the, the, the other sector, as you say, I think one, one thing I know UPTI has been very keen to promote uh, uh, in the run up to COP and during COP is that we should take a holistic approach, a strategic approach, but a multimodal approach above all. So we look at all the modes and the sectors collectively because most journeys involve more than one mode. and We don't really have rail journeys or lorry journeys or uh, car journeys. We have intermodal journeys and we need an intermodal solution. So you must particularly welcome, though, the Clyde Bank Declaration that de deals with one of the modes that perhaps doesn't get enough attention, and that is international shipping, where 19 countries have signed a pledge to establish green shipping corridors to encourage the shipping industry maritime uh, ports and uh, inland ports, as well as obviously the uh, international shipping community uh, to try and prioritize that sector. I know that's an area of your expertise, Ian. Uh, a lot of people say it's a small sector. Why does it matter? What, so perhaps you could talk us through why shipping matters, and why trying to promote green corridors between international ports is so important. I think, firstly, you know, international shipping, especially, fund underpins our, the way of life today. You know, if we want to go back to living locally with just what the materials we have locally, then that means a huge change. But if we want to maintain the style of living where we can at the moment, then we rely on international shipping. You know, things like iron ore are not distributed everywhere around the world. You have to have that certain regions to move that to certain areas of manufacturing. So there's no way we can get away from international shipping if we want to maintain you know, steel construction and other, other parts, you know, even agricultural foods and other things that we need to shift. But I think uh, the importance of the green corridors is very much to do with infrastructure. If we're going to move from fuels, etc., we need to have the incentive to move and to do it. Ships don't just fear themselves. There's a huge background to them about the crewing side of it, where the cargoes come on and off uh, for freight movement, and also the, the means to power these ships. If we're going to go to battery for certain uh, smaller short sea, sort sea shipping, then we need to have uh, infrastructure uh, port side to be able to provide that. Equally for deep sea shipping, where, where energy density fuels is, is more important, you need to make sure you can get those new fuels available, uh, where traditionally we've just relied on heavy fuels or, or, or marine gas oil. So the incentives there to, to create the infrastructure through these, these main corridors, which are key trade corridors, and there will be demand uh, from shipping lines uh, in pursuing the new green fuels. And, and the aim there on these shipping corridors is to go to zero emissions. Again, it's not greenwashing, Ian. It's a genuine commitment on the part of these 19 governments. It's only a start. There's obviously more than 19 governments party to these international uh, maritime trade. Uh, but I guess they're setting the bar quite high, but quite clearly there for the challenge for industry to make sure by a certain date, shipping routes move to uh, decarbonize. Yeah, and I think that's right. We've seen in the, in the Global Methane Pledge this last week uh, that we're looking at, and I think it has to be a genuine look at all emissions. You can't just look at carbon dioxide and, and ignore the others. We have to look at the true picture of what's coming out of ships and what's going in. You know, it's like the EV cars. 
we've got to make sure that the energy powering them is also renewable. So I think this whole well to wake movement rather than tank to wake is very important to make sure that we have it. I think from a personal perspective, I'm very keen we look at net zero and genuine net zero, not net zero because you can dec- you can offset somewhere, but genuinely the process goes to net zero. Because if we look at the you know the process here, I'm emitting carbon dioxide, which is the plants around me are taking and then recycling into oxygen. So I think as long as we have the carbon cycle within the atmosphere, the carbon we've got, and we're not looking to pull coal or others from under the ground and increase the carbon in the atmosphere, then we should be fine. So I think particularly for shipping with its particularly big engines, it's very hard to go to certain uh, zero emission fuels. Uh, we'll either have to create new ones such as ammonia or hydrogen from, from nothing, or I think there'll be a basket of fuels myself where we can use a mixture of fuels depending on the trade routes. But these, this initiative to have green trade routes to encourage investment in specific, which main routes between port pairings, uh, is very good news. Thank you, Ian. And um, bearing in mind again what we said, this is you know the big transport day at, at, at COP. So some you know mi- mi- mixed assessments there, 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 Ryan. Um, again, a lot of progress being made, particularly on the on the uh, the car and van side and the, the haulage side. I think uh, the UK government um, has also announced today that uh, by 2040 they will be insisting on zero emission HGVs on on UK roads. Um, I mean. Is that UK leadership role really making a difference? And how does it sort of complement perhaps what's happening at the EU level in terms of delivering a, a global green deal? Well, that's a great question. And I think given the, the UK's expertise in the transport sector, I think we were quite disappointed that transport wasn't given a more important role uh, at COP26. Um, and that there seems to be a lot of attention towards zero emission vehicles at the expense of other modes, uh, we would have rather seen a more holistic approach, uh, obviously. Um, and the UK government has, however, despite that, uh, taken on a big role of leadership uh, with its own uh, decarbonization plan uh, for the transport sector, which is uh, quite ambitious. Um, and the EU is doing its own parallel uh, uh, initiatives as well, right, with alternative fuels uh, for, for maritime, for aviation, um, also looking at uh, charging infrastructure for zero emission vehicles, you name it, and, the, and it's probably included in the European Green Deal. Uh, but zooming out a bit uh, and looking at the transport sector and where we're going uh, down the line, uh, you know, the International Transport Forum's annual transport outlook published back in May said that the transport uh, activity, uh, total transport activity will double between uh, now and 2050 based on a 2015 baseline. And that even if all decarbonization efforts are fully implemented, emissions will still increase by 16%. Now, the transport sector, we've often mentioned one of the only sectors with projected increases in emissions uh, going forward. It, It strikes me, and I'm sure you'll agree that we should put transport on a bit of a higher pedestal in COPs to come, given that it is such a climate laggard and has such potential to be a driving force of our pathway towards net zero. Okay, Ryan, do you you want to come back in on that? Yeah, just I think uh, this is my half half full speech. I think what's interesting too is, you know, shipping and aviation ducked it in previous, they're clearly front and centre now, part of the party. I think that will increase. Uh, as, as Ryan says, we're, we're increasing shipping uh, volumes uh, considerably. This, If you look at the container of trades, it, it's up markedly uh, since I'm recovering from COVID, particularly into the United States. So I think where we're going there, we're, the shipping industry itself is becoming more efficient so we can ship greater tonnages for less carbon. That will continue. So I think it's also it's very difficult. So it's, it's, it's one that people don't want to grasp that nettle because it's too difficult and not quite sure how to grasp it. But I think increasingly, as we see in future COPs, uh, shipping and aviation will be higher and higher profile, particularly as other industries, the, the low hanging fruit, as they say, the power industry decarbonizes. We get you know majority of cars on the road going to EV and, and a progress for that. So I think, yes, shipping and, and aviation are, are, are the bad guys at the moment in terms of, of CO2 per, per distance traveled in certain ways and in, in, in terms of shipping volume. When you think about the amount of you know eighty percent of, of exports globally go by sea, so so we're expecting that. But I, I think we'll see changes, um, and I know from the shipping companies themselves, there's huge impetus now 
to move from that. Uh, the UK, you mentioned about leadership. I think it's vital. The UK and EU look to leadership because if we can't do it, the rest of the world is going to say, well, why should we? You, know, you talk a good story, but we want to see the demonstration. I think with the EU, you know, fit for 55, when that gets through the, the parliamentary process, which is likely to be long and, and elongated, uh, but but it will be exciting. And I think the changes, and as I said before, that, that there's only one way of direction and, and that's down. Uh, and we're going to see more and more efficient uh, means of transport in terms of carbon. Well, thanks very much. I mean, maybe just in the final few minutes, we can turn to that issue of international leadership, because clearly, I think even with the prime minister heading towards COP26, he knows he's going to have to try and uh, build the momentum that's been achieved and take it forward in the coming year. And indeed, that seven page draft conclusion document that's been leaked overnight it seems to hint at that, that he seems to see himself playing a, an international role really for the coming year and beyond in making sure those international commitments are actually uh, uh, toughened up, but above all turned into policies on the ground. So I mean, maybe we could just sort of walk through what next and what the key dates and milestones are. Uh, I'm tempting fate now by trying to show you what Kadri Simpson said, uh, who's the European Commissioner for, for Energy, and apologies to everyone if the show collapses again. But let's try to listen to it for her very upbeat tone and what she thinks the EU can offer in terms of international leadership. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here today uh, representing the European Union at this historic moment. Since uh, the last COP in Madrid, the European Union has made a political commitment and a legal commitment to become the first climate neutral continent by 2050. The European Green Deal and the EU climate law set us on a green path for generations to come. As so just focusing on that, if we may, I mean, I think that the, the difference the EU would argue to other um, members of participants in COP um, is that they've turned their carbon commitment into law. The, the UK is essentially doing the, the same now with their their decarbonisation plans and their commitments to to phase out, for example, you know, uh, petrol and uh, diesel engines by a certain date. That's all going to be turned into UK law. Is this a path other countries should follow? This legislative path, regulatory path, or has the market got a role role to play in this? So, you know, it, it, Europe tried to um, show leadership, kickstart the process. Um, maybe Ryan first, then then, then Ian. Um, obviously, yeah. the John Kerry then came onto the scene and the U.S. administration have made a major impact, I think, in terms of uh, the U.S. Uh, commitments to uh, the success of COP26. Uh, but is the EU plan the right one for the rest of the world? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question, Mark. Uh, you know, the, some countries don't have that path open to them. Um, I'll put the U.S. here uh, as an example. Uh, U.S. has a far more complicated political environment that uh, prohibits it, for example, from joining uh, some pledges to phase out coal, even. Um, you know, and, and the, the hope in the U.S. would be that the market does the work that the politics can't do. Uh, whereas uh, in, in the EU, it was more of a case of the market wasn't moving fast enough. The politics has to intervene and legislate. So uh, it, it, it is no, there's no answer to, the, to that question. I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, so the EU being the bloc that it is uh, has that regulatory power available to it and it can make such a big difference. But other countries don't have that pathway uh, and are hoping that the, the market, market forces, uh, sorry, the, the market forces can make up where the politics can't act. Uh, and that's where we might see the U.S. What was the Air Force One passing you? Yeah, yeah. Not quite. The US president's more like the Royal Air Force. Apologies for the noise. I didn't get the, the pause button quick enough. Um, yes, I think from my side, um, yes, you need to have leg regulatory framework to make anything work. And I think that the point we're, we're in a unique situation, well, not unique, but a, an, an interesting situation in the UK because the prime minister has an 80 seat majority. Uh, if there are uncomfortable political decisions that generally for the longer term, we're talking 2050 here, he has the political uh, wriggle room to make it uh, and generally carry carry the parliament with them. Whereas if, if you're in a doubtful position, as we were with Theresa May, 
it was very difficult to any decision through much as, as President Biden is in the, in the States. But I think you need a regulatory framework to give clear guidance and a fair level playing field for everyone. But then I think that, that to echo uh, my chairman at CLNG, it's very dangerous to be prescriptive. I think we need to set clear guidance. We know we've got to get to 2050 with net zero and, and let the market develop it, but in a clear framework what's acceptable so that you know any greenwashing is, is, is found out very quickly and dismissed. Uh, but I think you know who knows what we're going to have in 20 years, uh, 30 years down the line when we get to 2050 in terms of best technologies to deliver net zero. Well, a final round. Thank, thanks for that clarification in terms of what the right right policy regulatory route will be for uh, the US and other countries that maybe have different models. And as we all know, Fit for 55 will dominate the legislative process in Brussels now for the next two or three years. And we'll see whether or not indeed, uh, you know, the ambition is very, very high, but whether the EU system is actually going to be able to deliver uh, that level of, of ambition. So we'll, we'll follow that very closely in future editions of this show. But final thoughts, colleagues, uh, if, 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 if we may, and I'll bring Tony back in if he can, uh, if, if he can still um, uh, able to join us. Just a final round of, of, of thoughts on, on COP26. I mean, maybe, you know, what, you know, what is your overall thought and where do we go from here? Maybe Tony, first of all, if you can uh, still uh, hear us. And you're still on mute, Tony. Sorry. I unmuted it once. Um, it can't have done any harm. It's done quite a lot of good. Um, but we still have to not only make sure that um, we in the UK play our part, but also make sure that other, mem other member states in the EU do and the rest of the world do. And also tackle the most difficult thing, which is the international travel by air or ships or whatever, and the inability of many of the countries of the world to be able to afford this. We must continue to push for a, a proper funding stream so we, so we can demonstrate that we're all in this together. Well, well thank you, Tony. Um, I'm sure the sentiments many of us uh, share, and sure if Murad was still on the programme, he would share them, them too. I Ian, final thoughts on where do we go from here? I think I'd, I'd echo what Lord Barclay's saying there. I think, too, people are meeting, which is great. And in a post-COVID environment, that people have the chance to meet. You've got relationships, not necessarily what's happening in the negotiating room, but behind. And if people are having a perhaps a slight libation, uh, maybe perhaps of some Scotch whiskey or even a beer in Glasgow. That's we, we, we even Ian Brew. I am Brew, uh, Ian, apparently. Uh, yes, indeed, popular. yes. And that great, that great uh, video, if you've seen it from the US Embassy. Uh, discussing iron brew and what on earth it was. But yes, I think that's the bit. And it's people talking and moving forward. Uh, and we hope the relationships built in Glasgow will go forward and take us there. Um, uh, yes, and, and international trade is not easy. But the other bit just to pick up, we talked about frameworks for me is we, we've got people together in COP on a global basis. But I think where the EU is coming from and, and the UK to a certain extent too, what the legislative process they put in place, other countries look to. If we can get it to work here, then others say, well, why don't we copy that? Or is this a model that make us work? But it has to, as, as, as Lord Barclay saying, we have to have an equitable solution. Unless it's equitable, people won't follow it. And we need to do it on a totally global basis. It's equitable for all. Otherwise, you know, and, in, and this crisis, it's not something for one country. We're all in it together. And um, final thoughts, uh, Ryan, on the week, on the last couple of weeks, and, and where, where we go from here? Uh, I think one word would be momentum. Um, we sort of entered COP a bit just depressed about the whole situation. You know, it was more focus on who wasn't going to be there rather than what we were going to discuss. But we are leaving COP, I think, with some momentum. Now, we can disagree as to the, the how much momentum. That's fine. But we have some momentum. And people tend to forget that between now, 2030, 2040, 2050, those are milestones. But you have other milestones in between. You know, and the first one I can think of would be the, the first uh, global stock take of the Paris Agreement uh, in two years time in 2023, where uh, we can assess where we're at on our pathway to net zero and we can make adjustments, of course. So, uh, you know, just because things are not agreed at this COP, they might be agreed at the next COP or at the, indeed the first global stock take of the Paris Agreement. So uh, momentum is very important uh, and pledges are also uh, uh, very important symbolically and to show the rest of the world that, you know, certain countries are doing more, uh, which means that other countries that are not doing as much have to catch up. 
Uh, and I think this is what we'll be seeing in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, you know, countries out there who haven't made any commitments to date will catch up. Those who have made disappointing commitments also have to as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic leaving COP, and I think uh, I would uh, summarize it in the one word being momentum. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Ryan, Ian, Tony, and Murad earlier for, for making this uh, show the success it was, helping us uh, navigate those twists and turns, what is a very complex uh, couple of weeks. But I think on the whole, I think Ian's uh, assessment, uh, the pint is half full, or the iron brew, whatever your tipple is, it seems to be the overall assessment. Some disappointment, but real progress made. And that phrase, uh, Ryan used there, momentum, I think a lot of the measure of this will be what momentum is generated on the back of COP26 uh, beyond the negotiations, which, as Murad said, may go uh, into the weekend or beyond. So thanks very much for joining us. Thanks to all our viewers. As always, do like, uh, share, uh, subscribe uh, to the channel, and do ask questions and comments for future editions of the show. We'll be back in about two weeks' uh, time. And we're going to leave everyone by attempting to play that European Commission video that we tried to play at the, right at the beginning to give a sense of really what this is this is all about. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Picture this. It is 2050 and together we have built a climate neutral society. Solar and wind energy has replaced fossil fuels. Our cars use clean energy and we breathe clean air. New jobs have come with modernization and green technologies. Our cities are greener and we are better prepared for heat waves and floods. Our forests and natural areas have grown and wildlife has flourished. We've averted the worst of the climate crisis. We are back on track. Sounds too good to be true. In Europe, we are convinced it's possible. If we start now, we can make it. In Europe, we have a plan, the European Green Deal, to become climate neutral and to grow our economy. At the COP26 in Glasgow, we will call on the world to raise ambition and take action that will lead us to a better future.